Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is David Dalton. I'm Acting Director of Policy Exchange. Thank you so much for coming along to this event this morning. Delighted to welcome Stephen Twigg, the Shadow Secretary of State for Education, who's here to talk about a blueprint for One Nation education with particular focus on vocational education. Um, this speech is very timely for us here at Policy Exchange because we published a report on Monday, uh, Technical Matters. There's copies at the back of the room if you want to pick one up later. Um, setting out a new approach to technical and vocational education. Uh, we made clear that we support the EBAC and support the focus on driving up academic standards, but we feel that the same rigour needs to be applied to vocational education as well. Um, the report sets out the proper vocational and technical track would benefit students who, whose needs are not currently being met, um, would tackle disengagement, um, Figures show that between 10 and 25% of students are disengaged at some point, and also deliver the skills that industry needs. Um, there was a study last year showing that we, we need to produce 10,000 engineer, more engineers a year just to actually meet the status quo. Um, and key to the, the uh, vocational and technical track we recommend is that there'd still be an academic core of English, science, and maths. Um, the importance of employer engagement in quality assurance and curriculum design is emphasised, and also the importance of high, high quality facilities um, is set out in this report. Um, so, without more ado, can you join me in welcoming Stephen Twick. Uh, th thanks very much, and good morning, everyone. I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to set out some of my current thinking on the future of technical and practical education, vocational education in this country. And if I can thank David uh, and the team here at Policy Exchange for providing me with this platform and also for the very important contribution that you are making to this vitally important debate. The report that you've published uh, earlier uh, this week I think reveals in very clear terms, both challenges but also the opportunities that we face as a country in delivering a vocational education system that will strengthen our standing in the world. And I think we can only really do this in a successful way, certainly in a way that is lasting and sustainable, if we can build the broadest possible coalition of support for change. And when I say a coalition of support, I mean across politics, across the world of education, across business, and of course, very importantly, amongst teachers and young people themselves. And I think that policy exchange is playing and can play in the future a really important role in helping us to build that coalition that will be in the best interest both of young people and their opportunities in life today and tomorrow, but also crucially for our future economy and economic growth and jobs in this century. I'm very pleased that the plans that Ed Miliband set out in his speech at the Labour Party conference in Manchester a few months ago are gathering such broad cross-party support. Ed spoke about a gold standard technical baccalaureate, and this has won support, obviously, in the policy exchange report this week, uh, very strong support from the Conservative former Education Secretary, Lord Baker, and albeit belatedly from the government itself in the form of the Minister for Skills, Matt Hancock. And I think this is the kind of consensus that we need if this is going to be long-term education reform. Let me just say something about the EBAC, because we do, uh, in the Labour Party, take a different view to policy exchange on the EBAC. And I think that both in terms of the process but also the substance, the kind of consensus we need in education is completely lacking in the government's plans to introduce English baccalaureate certificates. Actually, that's not quite true. There is a consensus about the EBAC certificate. It's a consensus against them that spans the CBI, the designer of the iPhone, the head of the Tate Gallery, the leading private as well as the leading state schools, the head of Ofqual, and the majority of teachers and their trade unions and associations. And it's not often that that kind of coalition can be assembled for or against any particular policy initiative. And it really reflects a set of concerns that I'm keen that we explore both today and beyond today about the dangers of a narrowing 
of the education curriculum, the risks associated with returning to a two-tier uh, system, but perhaps most significantly, and certainly relevant to today, a set of qualifications, 14 to 16, that are simply not fit for purpose for the society and the economy of the 21st century. As Ken Baker put it at the weekend, the EBAC is exactly the same as the exam that I sat, Ken Baker, in 1951 when I was 16, the school certificate. And that was changed, he said, even in 1951 because it simply wasn't broad enough for a large number of children. Only 7% of young people at that time went on to post-16 education. I was part of a privileged elite. And he says the EBAC is a throwback to that. And I'd like to add today that I think returning to linear A-levels is also a throwback to those times for exactly the same reasons, because it represents a further narrowing of the curriculum. So I will say that instead of seeking to recreate the past, the central question that we need to address is how do we reform our education system so that it equips young people with the skills, the knowledge, the resilience, the character that they need to play their part both as active citizens and as future business leaders and entrepreneurs. And I'm delighted that Tim Oates is here today. Tim, of course, has been advising the government on the national curriculum, and I've uh, enjoyed our conversations about Britain's uh, future path, including looking at our strengths as a country in terms of skills, innovation, and creativity. We need to ensure uh, that we play to those strengths rather than undermining them. And for me, strengthening the skills of young people in this country is actually a great patriotic cause. It should be seen as part of our economic mission and at the heart of any drive to maintain this country's competitive edge in the world. Now, as Tim has noted, the problem we have is that our vocational education system was designed many years ago in the aftermath of the Second World War, and what we then did was to export it to Germany, where it continues to prosper to this day. And there is a real risk that we lose the global race on skills. We need, I think, to be as strong as Germany and Switzerland on vocational education, but we also need to learn from countries like Singapore and Japan when it comes to maths, education, and numeracy. In the 1944 Education Act, uh, Rab Butler sought to make progress in this area. The proposed introduction of technical schools known as county colleges was meant to ensure that 15 to 18 year olds would get access to quality technical education to supplement their apprenticeships. But it was an ambition that was never realized. And ever since we packaged up an excellent plan and exported it to Germany, the post-war blueprint for technical and practical education, successive governments under both main parties have failed to deliver the step change that our education system and economy need. Now, it's widely known that this country was once the workshop of the world, and we've seen in recent decades a process of de-industrialization when Margaret Thatcher came to power, manufacturing accounted for almost a third of our national income, employing nearly 7 million people. By 2010, it was down to barely more than a tenth, employing 2.5 million people. And ever since the 1980s, there has been a very strong focus, rightly, uh, again by governments of both main parties, on school standards and on high expanding higher education. What I think is clearly the case is that successive governments have not done enough to help the 50% or so who do not go on to university. And I want us to focus our reformist zeal on the skills agenda so that we can drive up the standards of vocational and technical courses, including by getting employers to accredit them. And that is why we have placed vocational education front and centre in our plans for one nation education, because my fear is that without a clear drive and focus on raising the standards of practical and technical skills in this country, we might condemn ourselves to a decade of economic decline. Now, if we look at the leading countries for vocational education, it becomes clear the sort of step change that we need in our own country. I plan, uh, hopefully next month, to visit uh, Switzerland, where nearly two-thirds of Swiss upper secondary students enrolled in vocational education 
and training in a study of the 2000 cohort of Swiss youth. Vocational study was the choice of 42% of the highest academic achievers. In Germany, around half of all young people under the age of 22 have completed successfully an apprenticeship and they're offered by around one in three countries. And according to the OECD, the system in Germany offers qualifications in a broad spectrum of professions and flexibly adapts to the changing needs of the labour market with a high degree of engagement and ownership on the part of employers and other social partners. And if we are to match the Germanys and the Switzerlands, I think we need a major reform, including of the curriculum and qualifications. The CBI has argued that improving the quality of vocational education could add as much as a percentage point to our economic growth. And I think that instead of having courses designed by politicians, according to our whims and preferences, we need to involve businesses as well as the education world in accrediting the quality of vocational courses. And that's what we want to do as part of the new technical baccalaureate. Now, there are already some excellent top quality, gold standard qualifications around. One of those, I think, is the engineering diploma. In fact, you could describe the engineering diploma as a Rolls-Royce qualification, not least because Rolls-Royce were involved in designing it alongside the Royal Academy of Engineering, BAE Systems, and JCB. And I think it was very sad that the government chose to downgrade the value of that qualification from five GCSEs to only one. Bizarrely, since then, the Chancellor of the Exchequer has intervened to say that the government will now reinstate an equivalent qualification worth four GCSEs, but only from 2016. And I think the handling of this issue illustrates the incoherent approach that we've often seen from government on vocational education. I think we need to give students a clear route so that they can progress. And we know that there are too many young people who go through a revolving door of low qualifications that limits their potential. I'm delighted that Alison Wolf is here today. Alison noted in her report 350,000 young people gaining little or no value from this system. Simply getting a few level one or level two qualifications can often leave students at risk of ending up not in employment, education or training, or finding there's little return from the labour market for such a low level set of qualifications. And incredibly, what Alison Wolfe identified was that sometimes the system can even reduce their potential. Uh, young men with level two NVQ, she found, can actually earn less than their contemporaries with fewer qualifications. If you stop to think about that for a moment, that is staggering that these courses can actually leave the learners worse off than if they hadn't gone on the course in the first place. Now, there are obviously many complex factors around the revolving door of low qualifications. Issues around prior attainment and engagement in the early years are of vital importance, the wider social and economic context. But I think some of the decisions that the government has made since 2010 have made this situation worse. For example, getting rid of careers advice and the education maintenance allowance. We need, I think, to make sure that we get the incentives right in the system so that there is a clear route through that is respected by employers, by universities, and by parents. And that is what we're seeking to do with the proposal for a technical baccalaureate to motivate young people to progress well beyond level two, and alongside that, to provide more quality, high-level apprenticeships from which school and college leavers can move on. And I'm very interested in the recommendation in your report, in the Policy Exchange report this week, for three-year apprenticeships. What we've seen over the last two years is that the number of apprenticeships has gone up, but not enough of them have been of high quality, and too few of them have gone to young people. Many of the new apprenticeship starts have been about rebadging existing training courses, often for existing older workers, rather than giving young people a foot on the employment ladder. So what we want to do is to engage employers more in helping us to design high quality apprenticeships and giving them a bigger say in how we spend the billion pounds worth of funding that is already in the system 
system to target apprenticeships at young people. And we want to look at ways of bringing employers together, whether in regions, through sectors, or through supply chains, and ensure that they have the resources and the powers they need to improve training. These could be very powerful employer-led partnerships, working closely with FE colleges, bringing together industry stakeholders, and building on the existing landscape of employer associations, professional bodies, sector skills councils, local enterprise partnerships, and local chambers of commerce. Nearly half of employers say that the prospect of members of their staff who've been trained by them being poached by rival firms deters them from training employees. So we're asking business what system, what incentives are needed to ensure that they can deliver the expansion in apprenticeships that is so desperately needed. And we think then it should be up to groups of businesses themselves to decide how best to deliver these apprenticeships. We also want to see a new fast track for apprentices into the civil service, matching the fast stream for graduates. And we would make it a requirement for large firms with government contracts to provide quality apprenticeships. Part of the challenge here is a cultural challenge, as people here will be well aware. How do we best raise the status and the profile of apprenticeships? And we know that too many young people go through the education system without being provided with decent quality advice about apprenticeship. And given the reduction in funding for information and guidance, this is likely to get worse rather than better. Policy exchanges brought the challenges to light by illustrating as an example that nearly one in three young people drop out of their A-level courses, reflecting the fact that they may not have had the best advice to begin with. And we're looking at how we can improve the quality of advice to young people, including better awareness of apprenticeships. I, for example, would like to see schools and colleges providing apprenticeship taster days to teenagers. If pupils can take a few days away from the classroom to visit universities, which is a good thing, then I don't see why exactly the same principle can't apply to apprenticeships and visiting workplaces. Young people from the age of 14 should be able to get the opportunity to visit companies who have apprenticeships, to see what's involved in the programme, and to understand better the training and career opportunities that might then be open to them. I want children to aspire to a high-quality apprenticeship just as much as they might aspire to go to Oxbridge. It might surprise people to know this, but in fact a high-quality apprenticeship can be more competitive than Oxbridge. In 2010, BT received nearly 24,000 applications for just 221 apprenticeship places, considerably more than Oxford University's 17,000 applications for 3,000 undergraduate places. It can be done. I also want more broadly to look at how we can strengthen the relationship between the world of work and the world of education. I think that includes uh, business involvement, employer involvement in the design of the appropriate curriculum so that young people are work ready. I think it means more engagement of employers at a local level, including on school and college governing bodies. And I'm pleased to say today that we're looking at how we can reform the provision of work experience in schools and colleges. I think this government have sidelined that. They've ended the statutory duty for schools to provide work experience for 14 to 16-year-olds. I think we need a different approach. I want all schools to develop partnerships with local employers. A lot of this happens already, but I want that to be extended. I think at secondary school that needs to include a quality work experience placement linked very closely to the curriculum. That placement can't just be two weeks of photocopying and making the tea. It needs to be a rigorous programme that provides experience of workplace skills and follows up with teaching and learning in the classroom. And I think we need to go further than that. We need to look at how early we start building these links between the world of education and the world of work. I'm interested in the idea of work discovery programs to inspire primary school children about the world of work. That could include businesses conducting visits to local primary schools just to talk about the nature of their sector, organising trips to local workplaces for pupils. And some of these programmes do exist already. There are already innovative uh, programs to inspire primary school pupils. For example, the YES 
programme is a work-related teaching resource that provides bespoke films and lesson materials for primary schools. It provides primary pupils with a window into the world of work directly linked to the primary curriculum. Primary Engineer, a non-profit programme which encourages primary schools to consider careers in STEM, related professions, providing teacher training, interactive resources and competitions for school children. I think it is clear that if we're going to develop the future workforce and if we're going to develop a generation of entrepreneurs and innovators, we need to capture their imagination early. And creating that symbiotic relationship between schools and businesses is one of the tasks of the uh, One Nation Skills Task Force that we've now set up, led by Professor Chris Husbands from the Institute of Education at London University. We're taking advice from distinguished figures in the world of business and in the world of education and engaging over the next few months, including with young people and teachers as well. The task force has a remit that spans the whole of 14 to 19 education, and the aim is to develop rigorous routes academic, technical, practical, in order to improve the confidence of young people, parents, the education world about the future. One of the areas that needs to be considered as part of this is the quality of advice and guidance to young people. Since the government decided to give responsibility to schools for careers advice, we've seen 80% of schools cut dramatically the advice that they're providing, according to a survey by Careers England. And today, the Cross-Party Select Committee on Education has produced a withering assessment of the government's record on careers advice. They say that both the quality and quantity of careers advice and guidance has deteriorated in a time when, for obvious reasons, it's needed even more than in the past. The removal of face-to-face -face careers advice by the government could be hugely damaging in the long term. I'm very interested in some of the recommendations that the Select Committee has come up with today. For example, to restore face-to-face -face provision, for schools to be expected to provide an annual careers plan so they can be held accountable by parents. And as the committee notes, young people deserve far better than what is on, off on offer at the moment. To yet get young people ready for the modern world of work, we have to overcome some of the crude divides which set young people irreversibly down one route or another. Vocational versus academic is one of the many false choices that we face in education. Michael Barber, in his recently published essay, Oceans of Innovation, challenges policymakers and educationalists to reject the sort of either or thinking that he argues very persuasively has held this country back. We need to provide more flexibility for young people to do both traditionally academic and practical and technical courses. And as part of our reforms to the curriculum and to assessment, I want to ensure that there are more opportunities for young people to switch between different courses, to ensure that they play to their strengths, but also to ensure that they're getting a broad and balanced education. Now, there are many ways in which we can do that, but one, I think, is for schools to be developing much closer partnerships with both employers and further education colleges to ensure that young people doing GCSEs and A-levels are getting access to the expertise, the training, the equipment in vocational subjects that aren't always there in our schools. And I've seen some great examples of this. I recently visited Norwich, for example, and seeing the very good work that City Academy Norwich is doing with the local further education college. Last week, I had the opportunity to meet the principal of Barnsley College, who told me about very exciting, innovative plans to develop a quality offer working with local schools for 14 to 16-year-olds. It also means ensuring that those who achieve the new technical baccalaureate recognize that going on to university is a possible option for their future just as much as going into employment or a high-quality apprenticeship. It isn't the tech back simply for those who aren't going on to university. And I also want to ensure that we have rigour in the core subjects, especially in mathematics and English, but that we don't confine our focus on rigour to those subjects. It needs to apply right across the curriculum, and part of the way we do that 
is to improve the quality of the vocational offer. So as well as matching countries like Germany and Switzerland on skills, we need to ensure that we're learning from countries like Singapore, Japan, and Hong Kong on some of the core subjects. That means improving quality in English and maths. Now, I think we did a lot of good things on this when Labour was in government. The early focus under David Blunkett's leadership on literacy and numeracy in our primary schools played play, play, pay dividends. And if you look at the results in terms of SATs at age 11, very real improvements in both maths and English. And similarly, that is matched in improvements at 16 in GCSEs. Now, some may say that's all about grade inflation. Well, I don't think it is mostly about grade inflation. If we look, for example, at the TIMS uh, independent international survey conducted by Boston College, they actually show a very dramatic improvement in the performance of English uh, pupils in maths, where we were ranked 25th in 1995, but ninth in the most recent study last year, the second highest in Europe. Nevertheless, there is still a long way to go. Now, I'm very proud of some of the work that's going on in our schools, in our primary schools, to support children who struggle with English and maths. And I think some of the programs that have been most successful are programs like Every Child a Reader and Every Child Counts. I was visiting Broad Square Primary School in North Liverpool last Friday and saw Every Child Counts working in the classroom in a school serving a deprived community of North Liverpool. These are innovative programs backed by solid research evidence and often supported by businesses, in these cases by KPMG. Unfortunately, these are programs that have been cut by the present government despite the evidence of a substantial return on investment. We're seeing fewer primary schools getting access to this specialist reading tuition that is just so vital. So I think we need a renewed focus on the early years when it comes to literacy and numeracy. But I also think we need to move to a system where all young people are studying English and maths in some form right the way through to 18. As Professor Wolfe observed in her report, about half of young people leave formal education at 16, despite all the progress that I've just talked about, without reaching the expected level in reading, writing, and maths. And of those who are staying on after 16, she identified only 3% are going on to reach that expected level. Now, the government is addressing this point, but I think they need to go further. I don't think it is sufficient simply to provide resits for those who don't get a C grade at GCSE. I want us to look at new courses and new qualifications so that all young people, whatever route they're taking, carry on with English and maths until they're 18. I think a lot of pupils otherwise are overlooked. For example, pupils who get a B or a C in GCSE maths, only one in six of them then go on to do AS level maths. Put another way, Every year, there are more than a quarter of a million students who achieve at least a grade C in GCSE, but who don't or cannot continue studying the subject. And we are examining, as part of our review, how we could create those new courses and qualifications for those who want to continue studying English and maths, but who don't feel a whole A-level is the right option for them. We're actually one of very few countries in the advanced industrialized world that doesn't require young people to continue with maths and with their own language until they leave education at 18. And that results in a position where barely one in five students in England studies maths till they're 18, whereas in the US and New Zealand, the figure is more than 60%. And in Germany and Hong Kong, it's over 90%, with the education participation, well, participation age rising first to 17 and then to 18, this gives us an opportunity to fix this issue and to do so once and for all. Indeed, the university technical colleges, which started under the previous Labour government, show this can be done. They require English and maths to age 18. I want to learn from those innovations in UTCs, in studio schools, in FE colleges, in schools, so that we can build the very, very best system for all young people, but also for our economic future. Our strength as a nation is when we combine a drive for academic rigor with the creativity and innovation that has powered our success throughout history. And I simply reject the notion that there is some choice between those two things. We can 
do both. We must do both. It is a strength, I think, that will only continue if our schools, our colleges, our curriculum, our assessment are forward-looking and not uh, backward-looking, if we end the false divide between the academic and the vocational, and very importantly, if we inspire innovation so that we ensure that young people are themselves inspired and confident about the world of work from an early age. These are some of my thoughts on what is a very, very big subject. I'm grateful to all of you for being here today to listen, and I now look forward to having the opportunity to answer your questions and hear your points of view. I think with a relentless drive for improvement across our whole system, we can learn from Germany, learn from Switzerland, but also build upon our own history, our own successes, so that we're ready with an education system fit for this century. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Stephen. Very, very important speech. Um, we've got about half an hour for questions. Um, if anybody wants to kick off, we've got a gentleman back there. Uh, hello, Stephen. Uh, Bruce Liddington, uh, Director General of EACT, which is one of the largest academy chains. Um, I'm not quite sure whether I gave you this advice when I worked at the department, but I certainly gave uh, other ministerial colleagues the advice to abolish the Connections Service. And let me reassure you that having had national responsibility for information advice and guidance, the best thing that can have happened is that it should have stopped so that people think again about what needs to happen. A lot of it was very, very substandard and I think is responsible for the lack of clarity um, about the way forward that a lot of young people have experienced. But, but having laid my, um, my, my own view on that out, I mean, can, can you explain why the situation uh, in Germany and Switzerland is so different, having said so clearly that the genesis goes back to the Butler Education Act in the 40s, and indeed, I think, to the Haddow Report in 1926. Why is it so prestigious to go to a technical school in Germany and in Switzerland, and not here? Um, it's a big question, and uh, I hope I'll have a better answer than the one I'm about to give when I've been to Switzerland, <laughs> which, as I said, I intend to do uh, soon, hopefully, uh, next month. Uh, I think there are a number of different factors uh, at play. Uh, I referred uh, in my speech to, uh, if you like, cultural uh, factors. I'm going to tell a story that some of you may have heard me tell before. We had a discussion on these issues at the Shadow Cabinet, and one of my colleagues, I won't name him, uh, on a public platform, but he was talking about his own children, and that one of his children was becoming a teacher and one was becoming a plumber, and the reaction of the close circle of his friends was to say, way, you must be very proud of your daughter becoming a teacher, and a slightly more mixed reaction about the son becoming a plumber. Now, the son's probably going to earn quite a lot more money than the daughter, but uh, the cultural attitude, the prevailing, frankly, middle-class cultural attitude, was to see the academic as somehow inherently better uh, than the uh, technical and practical uh, course of um, employment that the son was following. I think, um, so there's a kind of culture, uh, almost a, a culture of snobbery that I think has prevailed in this country and is still very, very strong in this country that must be part of the answer. I think the, the difference, I think there's also a kind of difference in terms of politics, certainly between here and Germany, and probably Switzerland as well, uh, that there is a much more consensus-based approach to developing education uh, and probably broader policy in Germany compared to here. And I, and I am genuine in saying what I've said today, that if we are going to take these matters forward for the future, the more that we can do so on the basis of a consensus, not just in politics, but in wider society, uh, the better uh, that that will be. Uh, I also think, uh, and this speaks to a much broader debate about education, and Bruce will be familiar with the point that I'm making, we get very focused in our debates about structures, and you know, what, what's the best structure, what's the best type of school system to, to deliver, and actually not enough on the, the nuts and bolts and the content and the quality of teaching and learning. And I think that the contrast between the kind of, what, what is it now, 70 years since the Second World War, certainly in Germany and here, is partly to do with that as well. 
gentleman four rows back. Thank you very much, um, Nicholas Hazard from Edge. Um, listening to you, Stephen, um, I, sort of, I was waiting for you to say Tomlinson, because you, you're describing an overarching certificate, um, but it, it, that, that, we haven't got there quite yet, and I sort of was just waiting for that, the overarching certificate. Um, I've said on a number of occasions, and I said it again in an interview in The Guardian uh, last week, that I regret the way in which we dealt with the uh, Tomlinson proposals as a government back in 2004-05. I was a minister at the time, so I put my hands up. Uh, and I think we need to, to learn from the report that Mike Tomlinson presented then, but also from the experience of what was done subsequently with the development of the diplomas. And I, you know, I spoke positively about the engineering diploma, but I think the reality of diplomas was a, a more mixed experience uh, overall, and we need to learn uh, from that. Uh, what I don't want to do right now is to presume an outcome to a process that we've asked Chris Husbands and a number of other distinguished people to work on for us. And in fact, Chris and his team are meeting as we speak, uh, planning their work programme for the next six months. But I do think, and a number of us, Pam and others, were talking about this prior uh, to my speaking today, that we have an opportunity here to do something bold. And I'm very interested in the work that, that EDGE is doing, in what Ken Baker has been uh, talking about in this regard, and indeed the work that Mike Tomlinson himself has done with you on the technical baccalaureate. And I uh, met with Mike uh, a couple of weeks back to talk about some of those ideas. I think there is an opportunity here. Uh, I'm not saying to go back to a report that was published a number of years ago. I don't think anyone's arguing for that. Mike himself isn't arguing for that. But to get something, uh, in, in the 14 to 19, 19 phase of education uh, that is a much better system than, than the one that we have uh, at the moment. I think a very powerful case has been made that with the education participation age rising to 17, then 80, 16 becomes a less significant age in terms of the stage it is in young people's learning, but also uh, some of the broader implications for accountability in our school system, and we want to address all of those issues. The key for me is that if we're going to come up with something that is a significant change from where we are now, we want to do that uh, carrying people with us, because I'm very conscious when I go to colleges and to schools and just talking to people who work in education, people have a lot of gripes about current policy, Yes, but they also have a lot of gripes about the tendency of politicians to come in and want to change everything. Now, if people are unhappy with how things are going, but they don't want things to change, then clearly there's a bit of a contradiction there. But I, but I can understand where people are coming from. So if we are going to come up with an alternative, it's got to be one that can be, uh, have wide support and can last. And I've said this on a number of occasions, I think we can learn from the experience of GCSE implementation. Now, the idea of moving to GCSEs was first floated in the 70s when Shirley Williams was Education Secretary and then implemented a decade later by Keith Joseph and Ken Baker. Now, I'm not saying we need a decade, but I think that process is something from which we can all learn. And I have to say I would contrast it um, with the present process of reform on English baccalaureate certificates where there isn't that same attempt uh, to build that broad consensus and therefore I fear if that change even happens that it won't be one that will last. The lady in the back row. Uh, thanks very much. Pam Tatlin from the University of Think Tank Million Plus. Stephen, thanks for a, a fascinating speech, particularly on the day when we've got an announcement about A-levels, which actually challenges some of the responses that have been put in and risks creating a two-tier A-level system. So I, uh, we very much welcome the fact that you might be looking in particular at 14 to 19 education rather than just be hung up on a T baccalaureate. Because there are risks there, um, there is a misunderstanding amongst politicians of all parties about the university offer in the UK, which is not the same as in Germany. And there is a lot of technical and professionally focused education that leads to employment, that works with business, based in universities. And people progress to university with BTECs and not just A-levels and not just at 18. So when Labour has a tendency to say the TBAC 
It's not the university qualification. That's got to be wrong. The TBAC and 14 to 19 must open pathways to everybody, whatever stage they are at, at stage, and it shouldn't limit people by age. One in three undergraduates now progress to university when they're over 21, and they progress as well with a level <coughs> three qualification, and that must count. Abs absolutely, and that, that, that's, Pam, part of the reason why I made the point deliberately uh, in the speech today that the technical baccalaureate can indeed be a route into apprenticeships, but can also be itself a route into higher education. And um, what you've, you're not the first person to say to me what you've just said, uh, and I appreciate it. Um, we, what we wanted to do around the conference last year in Ed's speech was to make a point around what he described as the forgotten 50%, because there is a sense that we had a big focus when Labour was in government on expanding higher education, which continued the expansion that had started under the previous Conservative government. Much of that expansion was exactly in the courses that you're describing uh, today, but what a lot of people say to us is you didn't have enough to say about the other 50%. Now, I realise that if you say that and then say technical baccalaureate, it sounds like the technical baccalaureate is just for the other 50%. I think we absolutely need to have the flexibility for young people who are following a technical baccalaureate to go on to university, both in the ways you've described, or indeed to go on to more traditional academic courses in universities as well. It's that flexibility that we want to make sure is there in the program. Lady in the third row, had a hand up. Thank you, Elaine McMahon, Hill College Group. Um, I was very impressed by how you spoke about employability and the role employers can play with educational institutions in actually improving both their business opportunity but for young people and adults, employment opportunity. You also, Stephen, spoke about deindustrialization. Um, much of what you say about education and the way policy should go, recognizing creativity as well as academic rigor, I relate to. But without a very good industrialization policy, an educational policy will flounder. Um, how do we improve those two parallel lines, bringing them together? How can we get more jobs? I come from an area where one in three young people in Hull and Gould don't have any chance of employment. Um, this is absolutely critical for us in the north of the country. Um, I just would like your thoughts on that, if you can broaden it to, as you raised it, uh, I, th I think it's. I think the point you're making is a, a profound one because clearly um, there, are, there are two sides of an equation here: uh, getting young people to be in a position where they can take up the sorts of jobs that there will be in the future, but actually ensuring that the numbers of those jobs are there. And I mean, I remember Tim saying to me when we were talking uh, late last year that there is a risk sometimes in policy that it sounds like we think that simply by improving the skills of young people and indeed older people, that itself creates the jobs. And of course you need to have both. You need the supply side and the demand side to be there. And, you know, your question in a sense tempts me into broader policy around you know, the nature of economic policy to deliver the jobs and growth that's needed in the future and the nature of the industrial strategy uh, that is needed for that. And I think um, you know, Ed Miliband has been uh, very articulate about this in saying that a, a weakness uh, in policy over the last three decades, including the 13 years that Labour was in government, was that we didn't have that focused industrial strategy and that the impact of that is felt across the country, but it's felt especially hard in regions like where you are and like Liverpool, where I'm an MP, and, and the need for a, an intelligent um, policy that recognises that, that, for example, uh, builds on city regions, like the city regions have a very important role to play, certainly in somewhere like Liverpool, but in, in, in areas like yours, a more localised and regional approach to some of those policies too. It needs to be both, doesn't it? Because what we can't do is go to the other extreme and get the economic and the industrial side right and not address some of these issues around skills and education, because then we have big skills gaps and opening up issues of having to uh, recruit people from overseas when we actually have people in this country who could be taking up those opportunities. Uh, can I just take this opportunity to plug a series of events we're having about a new industrial policy Brilliant. over the next few months um, on, on that very issue. The gentleman, um, second row from the back. Uh, 
Chris Wilford from the uh, Recruitment and Employment Confederation. Uh, very good to hear some of your points, um, talking about business linking with schools. Um, I'm talking about industrial policy. I just wanted to see where you uh, currently sit on the debate raging in the arts. I think Britain often ignores, or dare I say it, treats with disdain uh, its world leading position in the cultural and creative industries. Um, I just wanted to see, with a lot of people worried about the future development of of that position, the current policies being pursued, where you sit, I think we should all remember that though Apple was born and developed in California, uh, it was a man from Chingford, Sir Jonathan Ive, who led the way in design. Absolutely. And, I mean, Sir, Sir Jonathan Ive has been very forthright and articulate in his criticism of the impact of education policy on the arts and design, and uh, he's spoken about the impact of the English Baccalaureate. And, um, let, let me say something about that. I, I referred to it in my speech. Clearly, the English Baccalaureate is two different but related things. There's the, the measure that was brought in quite early in this government of a, a, a basket of subjects which um, some young people would achieve, and then there'll be a published measure uh, institution by institution. And then there is the English Baccalaureate certificates that are currently being developed that will initially be uh, in English, Maths, and Science, and then extend to other EBAC subjects and then potentially, we don't really know, perhaps to other subjects as well. I think there are lots of problems with it, but I think the argument that has come from the arts world is a really powerful one, and it's tr it's, there's two elements to it. One is, straightforwardly, fewer young people studying those subjects, and I think that has direct implications for uh, the creative industries, as you've rightly said. If fewer young people are doing design or fewer young people are doing art or fewer young people are doing drama and music that has direct implications for creative industry so there is a very very hard edged economic point that needs to be made in which the um, world of design and arts including sir john jonathan i have been making really powerfully i think there is also a broader citizenship point about it as well that actually it's not good for developing a rounded set of young people if they're being pressured to give up subjects like music and art at a young age when they otherwise wouldn't want to. So I think there's a hard edge point, but there's also a really important uh, citizenship point that needs to be raised as well. Now, uh, we had a debate on this in the House last week, and you know, Michael Gove challenged me on this, suggesting that somehow what we were talking about was depriving working class kids of the opportunity to do the hard edged academic subjects. And that absolutely is not the argument at all. It's actually about meeting the uh, potential and the aspirations of all young people. And I want more working class kids to go to university and I want therefore more working class kids to be doing uh, academic subjects that will help them to get to university. It's part of the reason that we've made the argument for English and maths continuing through to 18. But the other point that Michael made on Monday was around creativity and he said, are we suggesting that you can't have creativity in English and in history and in, and of course you can, but you also need, I think, that broader curriculum for the reasons that you've given. So uh, part of the mission that we've got with our husband's review is what is the nature of a 14 to 19 curriculum and then the assessment that goes with it that can promote a broad and rich curriculum. And for me, within that, both creative subjects and creativity and innovation across the curriculum must be at the heart of that. And I think if you narrow the curriculum and assess it simply on linear exams every two years, so linear EBCs, linear A-levels, you actually squeeze out a hell of a lot of that creativity. Then five rows back. Uh, Sarah Heim from the Federation of Small Businesses. Um, we share your interest in employability skills and the relationship between businesses and, and local schools, but one of the concerns we have is that two-thirds of our members have never been contacted by a local school or college. And from our engagement with uh, an education <coughs> partnership, we recently received feedback that they have lots of employers willing to want to go to schools and speak and offer work experience, but actually they don't necessarily have the schools so willing to have those employers come in and do those sorts of things. So I wonder from your perspective what you could do to encourage schools to engagement with local small businesses. Is, is, what, is your experience of education business partnership as a, as a broker, is that, is that a, mod, a, a model that you think is useful or? Um, I think some of them do work. We yeah. have uh, feedback from members who do engage um, with those and, and have used them. Um, but I think there was that concern that, that perhaps not necessarily the schools are, are quite mm. as interested as, as some might be. I, th I think this is a, a key point. And certainly when I'm visiting, going around different parts of the country, the 
the, just the, the, the level, the quantity, but also the quality of the relationship between local employers and, and local schools and colleges seems to me to vary enormously. And I suppose like with anything else, the factors that make it vary are partly to do with the attitudes of local employers and schools, but also I think sometimes to do with who's doing the brokering. Is there an effective system of brokering? Which is why I asked the question, because I think education business partnerships, when they work, can be a really good way of bringing, around, bringing about that brokerage. I think we need to look at we need to look at what the barriers are. I think there hasn't been consistency of message from governments about how important this is. So I think if we can get a more consistent message from government, that might help. Uh, what schools uh, will sometimes say is that the accountability framework, the very strong emphasis on 5A starters at GCSE can mitigate against doing some of the things like working with employers. Now, I see a lot of schools that still do it, so I'm not sure how strong that argument is, but I think we do need to look at the accountability framework as part of it as well. But I also think, and I say this to my colleagues in Parliament, we as MPs, whether we're in government or opposition, whatever role we're playing, we can play a role on this as political leaders. And I did a visit um, a few months ago to Wolverhampton, where the, one of the local MPs, Emma Reynolds, got businesses and schools around the table, and we battered some of these issues out. And to be honest, the employers said the sorts of things you're saying, and the schools said the reverse, that, you know, that they found that difficult to get the employers in. And it can be six of one half of them or the other, but I think if those relationships are built up at a local level, that's going to be the way that they're sustained, uh, more even than anything that can come from kind of central uh, government direction. Tim Oates in the front row. Uh, Tim Oates, Cambridge Assessment. Um, I welcome the reference to the quality of learning in your speech, actually. It's unusual. And I think it's because the, the emphasis that we've seen on structural and qualifications reform has been sort of all pervasive, actually, for the last two decades, and, and has ignored the issue of the quality of, of learning in, in the workplace and on the vocational route. And, and your comments uh, in response to the point about um, you know, why Germany and Switzerland are not trying to focus in both the volume and quality of their provision. It, it is a complex mix. You mentioned cultural, but it's also related to structures like labour market regulation, industrial strategy, the form of social partnership, and so on. But, and it's a big but, a very strong emphasis on quality, what actually goes into the learning. And I think there, the, the contrast with HE is quite important and palpable. And I'm not here attacking particular HE institutions. But I think that the strength of the policy exchange report and, and commentary around it, um, one of the strengths is this focus on what the programs should consist of and the differences between HE provision and provision through a vocation. I'll just illustrate it very quickly. I mean, we've done analysis work at Cambridge which suggests that over 50% of HE provision is very directly vocational in character. Engineering, medicine, law, accounting, surveying, and so on. But, but you mustn't ignore the fact that there are key structural differences between HE routes and an apprenticeship route. The psychological contract is different. The way in which people forego their income is different, which leads to a different relationship with employers. And it's critical to look at what is actually learned and how it links to the labor market and the requirements of work. And I think there are fundamental differences between classical apprenticeship and higher education provision in terms of what it's linked to. It's the kind of deal that the young person thinks they're getting into and who it is that they're getting into a deal with. So I think the challenge, therefore, is, is building quality but without bureaucracy. That's what we've seen in terms of trying to increase apprenticeship size. There's the volumes in that room. There's a massive growth in bureaucracy and strength on providers. So we have to build the quality, which is a very conscious focus of these other countries but in the context of, of non-oppressive bureaucracy. Well, I think I'd just say thank you to Tim for that, because that's very, very helpful for us as we develop um, our thinking. And I'm acutely aware that there is always the risk, and it comes back to the answer that I gave to, to Bruce's question, that uh, in politics it can be about the numbers and ticking boxes and the desire to move things very quickly because the political and electoral cycle expects that. Uh, I think the Richard Review is a really important piece of work on apprenticeships and I think if the government uh, carried forward the recommendations of Richard, they would have to 
in doing that, and I think that will take a lot of this forward, including on the crucial, crucial point you've made about policy. Thank you. We've got just time for a couple more quick questions, I, th I think, at the back. Um, the lady at the back, if we can take two at once, the lady at the back and the gentleman two rows in front. And thank you for your kind references to the report. Um, I, it's really an observation, because I don't expect a, a, an answer to it, really. Um, I have a slightly different take on 1951 from Lord Baker. Actually, it was the moment at which this country took off from the rest of the world and moved to going down a path of individually accredited qualifications rather than group towards. Um, and the rest of Europe in particular developed a variety of group towards and we went down a pathway of individual qualifications individually accredited. And when you said that you were opposed to moving to linear A levels and you liked the idea of modular certification, it did seem to me that you were actually um, in line with the actual government, which was, very, which was the architect of this change, because it felt it was important for people to be able to acquire um, a certificate here, a certificate there, and so on. And it's really actually um, an observation that once you go down that pathway, it is impossible to be like most of continental Europe. And the diploma was, in a sense, an, an attempt to, to shift that. Um, and basically, the English population voted with its feet. Um, they just basically didn't want their kids to do it. So I think the question to which I don't really answer a, a expect an answer is, um, in your thinking about the technical back and about future grouped, apparently grouped towards, are you actually thinking about more of a European pattern in which things are held together in tight boxes and you do one or the other, which I personally would oppose, or are you thinking more of a much broader and looser envelope? Um, I, 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 I don't know what your answer is. No, no, no I, 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 I don't, I don't think, think that is premature, because I think we are, we are looking at the broader envelope. I don't think we're looking at that sort of separation at all. And part of, my, part of why I said what I said today on the AS level is I think the aim of the AS level, which in many ways was quite a modest reform, was to allow a bit more breadth in year 12, rather than moving immediately to the, for those doing A-levels to, to two or three subjects at the age of 16. And that's my concern with the suggestion that AS levels wouldn't count towards uh, a, uh, the full A-level. Uh, so yes, I think we're, we're not looking at going to kind of tightly defined routes um, at age 14. We are definitely looking at a system where there is that ability to move across between different routes. And, and I think, I, I guess that is different to Pembaker in, in that regard. But, uh, yeah. That's fair. It won't do my Labour credibility any harm if you're saying that I'm doing what the Act of Government did, by the way. So. Thank you. <laughs> um, we're slightly pressed for time. We'll just take one very quick final question. There. Thank you. Um, Mark Weirden, I, I chair an academy. Um, just to pick up on the point that the lady from the Federation of Small Businesses made, um, you know, one of the interesting things I've seen, I, I'm a businessman in my normal life, <laughs> somehow I find spare time for, for an academy, but we... We have no problem convincing governors, we have no problem convincing senior management teams in schools that these links with local businesses are excellent and the right thing to do. As you get down to the core of the teaching staff, we have two problems. One is that majority of them, and I've seen this in a number of schools now, have very little experience of anything outside academic institutions, so they actually don't know what the real working world, so to speak, looks like. And the other picks up exactly the point that I think it was Tim was making at the front, which is also there's a, there's a sort of real sort of uh, denial of quality in anything other than the sorts of routes that they're taking. I just wonder how we try to address this with teachers. Denial of quality in anything other than... Than the academic route. Yeah. So, I mean, it's yeah, yeah, all yeah, I'm absolutely. sharing. We, yeah. You know, we're, we're setting up some very good links with our further education college, and we're doing some quite exciting things with them along the lines we're talking about, mm. saying you know, vocational versus academic isn't what it's about. We need to work together. But actually, as we've got into the core of the teaching staff, that's where the resistance is coming. Mm. And does that, I mean, is, is part of the solution to that, do you think, to do with CPD and the nature of initial teacher education? You know, that, that could be addressed as, as part of it. Different routes into teaching so that we have people coming into teaching later on in life, as well as those coming at a younger age who may themselves have worked in, in industry or indeed in other parts of the public and voluntary. Yeah, and that's, that's the sort of cultural change that I spoke about. 
that I suppose doesn't say anything particular about teachers. It simply says that teachers reflect that broader culture in society as a whole. And I've seen quite a lot of schools that are doing the sorts of things that you're doing and successfully doing that with buy-in uh, from their teachers. So I think it can be done. Uh, I suspect that there will be some things that can be done through national policy, but most of this is going to be people like you delivering it on the ground and, 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 and succeeding on the ground. Yeah, of course. Of course, yeah. yeah. Very sorry to say that we're out of time. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, can thank the Minister of the Shadow of the Secretary of State for... Uh, <laughs> thank the Shadow of the Secretary of State for... Uh, <laughs> for giving such a fascinating speech about this. It's really important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.